Lithium demand is expected to surge in coming years as electric vehicle sales grow, meaning countries are racing to secure supplies. Our next guest says it's not too late to stop China becoming the OPEC of lithium. Graham Harris is the chairman of Surge Battery Metals and joins us now. Graham, let's just talk about that concept, uh, the OPEC of lithium. Is there a real risk that China could become the major supplier here? Well, there is a real risk, and I mean, it's happening now. I mean, that is uh, the fact that uh, China produces 80% of the world's batteries. And we all know that when uh, one country has uh, that kind of supply monopoly, and it harkens me back to the days in the late uh, 1900s, and I don't want to date myself, but we had a lot of oil shocks in, in America. And until America developed its own domestic energy policy, it was beholden to, uh, to foreign entities, and it crippled uh, a lot of the economy at, at times when there are geopolitical tensions. And as we move forward here, everybody's mandating, you know, electric vehicles are going to be the, you know, the choice uh, in the future. So by 2035, 2050, we're, uh, you know, outlawing uh, petrol and, and diesel cars. And with all these, um, you know, EVs coming on stream, we need a secure supply of batteries to, to drive these vehicles or else you're going to cripple that economy as well. How easy is it going to be to secure lithium, though? Because I can see there are large reserves in some places like Chile. There's a decent amount of production in places like Australia. But some of these reserves can be fairly depleted quickly in this transition process. So how do we think about securing long-term supply of lithium? Yeah, great question. I mean, lithium is not uh, in short supply. It's just finding the, uh, the good projects. We do have a large source of lithium in the States. It's in mainly the clays. And what we have to do is develop those clay assets. And the Inflation Reduction Act um, from Joe Biden has set aside $6 billion here to encourage uh, domestic uh, battery production and also domestic consumption in the states. And that's going to go a long way to helping companies such as ours develop these assets. So you're saying then it's not ultimately that lithium isn't actually available. It's the discovery thereof, which perhaps dates back historically to having not found enough sources of that. Is that, is that where we're currently at? Well, it's not just that, but lithium being a new sort of uh, technology, people haven't been searching for lithium until the past 20, 30 years. Uh, we didn't need it, other than in you know, medical supplies, and uh, we didn't need a lot of it then. But now we, we seem to need great quantities of it, and we do have lithium. It's just a question of finding it. Uh, we have the technologies to extract it from the brines, the hard rocks, and now the clays. And it's just about uh, developing the, the, pro the projects that we know are out there. That's going to hurt the second-hand EV market as well, right? I mean, it's not just the first-hand because you have, yes, you have a whole lot of these um, new EV, uh, you know, brands coming into market. But if you're going to buy a second-hand EV car, you're going to think about, well, that battery might not be, you know, or might have had the wear and tear that I probably could, could, not, could not take on. That, that kind of hurts that market too, right? It definitely hurts that market. I mean, I always tell people, lease your electric vehicle because the next electric vehicle is probably going to have twice the range. And you don't want to be the guy who's buying the, the first Prius that's only getting 80 kilometers. You want to be buying the one that's got 500 kilometers of range. Uh, so as battery technology advances, and interestingly enough, most advances in battery technology tend to consume more lithium, um, yeah, it, we, we need a again to encourage and under the Inflation Reduction Act you're getting encourages in the recycling process of these batteries as well and that's key. The money and the subsidies is one thing the other is the environmental concerns here and we've seen across the United States over the last decade or so very split public and also very split regulators on the, how they see these decisions. What sort of regulatory hurdles are you facing now as you talk about it, ensuring that there's lithium supply from the United States? The usual regulatory hurdles, I mean, I'm in the uh, you know, development side, I'm not in the battery manufacturing side, we're in the exploration side. It's, it's the environmental hurdles, it's the permitting hurdles to get projects like ours up and running. And that's where we need some kind of uh, you know, incentives and, and sort of a, a clearer goal in, in terms of the environmental standards that need to be set. Most miners, I, I'd say all miners, want to adhere to a, a strict environmental standard and share in, in the projects through the NGOs and, and the interested parties. So. We're just looking for a level playing field. Has there been any change, though, in the psychology around that regulatory process? Because we know as we talk about supply chains, that's quite different to where we've been over the last even five years, where there were concerns about pristine environments, protecting you know, certain parts of the United States. Has that now changed to an extent because of the supply chain considerations? From my perspective, we haven't seen it yet. Yes, there are supply chains considerations, but it hasn't filtered down to the 
to companies such as ours having an easier path to development. We still have to go through the same rigorous protocols that we always have. There's no lessening in, 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 in what we have to achieve and do to get a project like ours online. This is fascinating because in the old days when that was the case, then a lot of big companies, American companies, other Western companies, just looked elsewhere. They looked at um, the, the Congo, they looked at Chile, they looked at you know, places much further afield. Why is that not an option now? Well, you've got all these geopolitical risks that are coming on. I mean, if you want to try to source your, um, you know, your lithium in, in one of the Congos or the West African countries, we have eight West eight coups in West Africa in the last three years. I mean, I, I wouldn't want to be beholden to a foreign entity that's going to that's going to change and, and limit that supply right away. And that's why we're encouraging the domestic uh, consumption, the domestic production of lithium. Is that not where then it, it perhaps means that it's a little bit. What's, what's the word then? Unrealistic, maybe, to expect that we would have petrol and diesel cars perhaps out of this market in about 10, 15, 20 years even, considering the lag we have in things like lithium batteries, which are possibly one of the most significant components here. I think you're starting to see some of the, these numbers relaxed, uh, as I see it all over time here, especially in the UK. It was going to be 2030, and now it's 2035. It's not going to be that it's not going to happen as dramatically and upfront as we thought it was going to be. It's going to be extended over time. There's going to be that time lag where people realize that you, you can't just institute this in the next 10 years. But I think by 2050, with a longer time behind, the way this is going, it's EVs are going to be the, the car of the future. And it's just it's gradually going to wean out over time. When we get to that time, do you think swappable batteries become a thing as well? I mean, <laughs> it just makes a little bit more sense because you won't be able to sit and charge if you're halfway through your journey, surely. Well, maybe it'll be that the range in that battery is a thousand kilometers and you won't have to swap it out or a thousand miles or there'll be some other type of uh, advances in battery technology that might be a little better than having to stop and swap it out. Can I ask you more about the politics out of China? Because in Europe, there's an investigation that's begun into whether the subsidies and the excess uh, stimulus that's been created by the, the government in China is creating an unlevel playing field for European producers. And that's even those that have operations on the ground, potentially in China as well. What do you make of the uh, level of production, battery production first up coming out of China, but also greater subsidies across the EV market? Does it create an unlevel playing field? Is there an argument that this is quite negative for some of the Western economies? I would think, you know, and we're seeing this now with the Inflation Reduction Act. I mean, uh, Europe's response was to start with a new green energy deal because they thought it was unfair that America should um, create such uh, enormous amount of subsidies that would affect the European markets. So now they're creating their own new green deal as well. So it, it, it kind of works both ways. Uh, it's hard to say what China, are they flooding the market? They just happen to have captured most of the lithium supplies from most of the countries and they just got ahead of the curve to create these batteries. And unless we put in a domestic the battery production source, we're, we're going to be at, uh, beholden to them in terms of pricing and, and supply shock. Graham, appreciate the time. Thank you so much for the chat. Really appreciate it. Graham Harris is uh, chairman then of Surge Battery Metals as we unpack the EV market as well as lithium. There.